All right, so talking this morning, I'm going to be kind of, uh, I'm a bit of a teacher, so I'm going to be taking you around in a circle, tying it all together. So just, just bear with me. It will all come together as we go through it. Um, we are living in difficult times, right? Challenging times. I've been on this earth a lot longer than any of you guys. <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking about this yesterday and how the culture has changed, how things have changed. And just this year has been a, a very heavy year for, um, for everybody. I'm going to say particularly for me, I've lost two people this year and with COVID and the business and, you know, lots of other things happening. It's just, it's been a very challenging year. And yet it's been a year of, even in the midst of all that, of personal and spiritual growth. And that's what God wants for us as people, is that we are constantly moving forward and constantly growing in Him, right? God is so passionate about us. As we were worshiping, I just felt like God saying, he, inside of me, and it's like, I just, I wish, I wish my people would know how passionate I am about them. Yeah. And I wish that they were as passionate about me as I am about them. And it was just like I could feel the heart of the Father, you know, reaching out with that passion. Because God has always been passionate about his creation, because that's exactly who we are. And so in this season, particularly, and even if the season wasn't here, God's plan for us has always been not just to come into the kingdom and be saved, but to grow and to mature, mm -hmm. right? Um, Jeremiah and I were, we were actually talking this week. We had a great lunch, and we were talking about the ten virgins. And you know how the ten virgins, Jesus tells the story of where um, they were waiting for the bridegroom to come. And so in a sense, we, we looked at it as like, well, they were all Christians. Only five were ready. They had the oil. They had prepped themselves. Right? So when the bridegroom came, they got up and they left. The other ones weren't ready. They weren't, prepared. They weren't prepped. They weren't filled. They were, whatever was going on in their lives, they weren't ready. Right? And so this, this kind of fits into this message because we are the bride of Christ and Christ is coming back. Some people would say, hey, you know what? We are in the last days. If you go on it on Facebook and stuff, they're saying, hey, you know what? Jesus is coming like real soon. And whether he is or not, I think that the church will be in for some trying times in the next few years, right? So we've got to put ourselves in a position of where we are full, where we're tight with Jesus, where we're tight in our relationship with him. So having said that, we're all at a different level of maturity in our walk with God. We've all been saved at a different time, different point in our life, right? And experienced different things. You know, it's interesting because you can be in the way for a lot of years and still not be at the maturity level of someone who's only been saved five years. Because mm -hmm. you know what who it depends upon? How quickly you grow when you mature? Depends on you, on me, mm -hmm. right? On what we do with it and are we willing to grow? I had a Facebook quote that says, whatever you're not changing, you are choosing. So if, you know, and mm -hmm. well, that'll come through as, as what we're talking about here this morning. Hebrews 12, chapter one, Chapter 12, verse 1. The writer of the Hebrews says, Therefore, since we are surrounded with so great a crowd of witnesses, I got a little bit of a different translation on here, let us throw off, that one says, let us also lay aside, my version says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Right? Let us throw off everything that hinders. That means that there can be things that hinder our lives, right? There are, there are circumstances that can hinder. There is, there is a culture, there's a mindset that can hinder our walk in our race with God. Um, the sin that so easily entangles, right? It's very easy for sin to come and entangle us, to trip us up off of our race in the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 9, chapter 2. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. And Paul is writing, he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? So run in such a way that you may win. Right? If you're in a race, how many have been in a race in school? Right? You're running, you've got a whole bunch of people, you're racing. You're supposed to run like you're going to win. You don't go, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to win, so I'm just going to run. No, you, Paul says, run so that you are going to win. So that means there's got to be some gumption on the inside of you, right, to run. He says, 
run in such a way that you will win. Because everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Right? You're not going to win the race. You're not going to be able to even run the race well if you've got no self-control in your life. And I love the stuff that Jeremiah's been teaching. The fruit of the Spirit. You'll see the fruit of the Spirit all through this message. But it takes self-control and discipline, right, to discipline your life so that you can run to win, that you have the endurance to win, that you have the passion to win, right? They do it, talking about the Olympians, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, Paul says, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way, I'm not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I will not be disqualified. This is Paul, like seriously, right? He's going, I, after I preached to everybody, I got to be disciplined in my life. I got to walk with God. I've got to strive and reach, right? And live my life the way God, the purposes that God has given him to, pre, to, to live. Mm -hmm. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, he goes, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind. Okay, Paul was a Jew of the Jew, right? He was schooled. He was, he was high in the hierarchy. He had been studying the law for his whole life. He was, I mean, did you read through, I challenge you to read through the book, and he'll tell you all of his credentials. And you know what that's, and he says, I'm counting all those things that is lost. They don't matter to me. But how many Christians go, uh, hey, look at me, I'm arrived. I've been a Christian for so long. All right, you know, I go to church on Sunday morning, and I'm just, look at me, I've done this, and I've maybe read a book, or I've done, I've, oh, I was loving over here, look what I did over here. And even pastors, sometimes they go, well, look at the church I built. Look at the people who are coming. Look at the books. Look at how worship services that we have were great. We got a thousand people in our church. And, you know, sometimes they sit there, and they go, hey, look at me. And Paul says, I don't care about that. I don't care about what I have done, what I have accomplished. What I do, I forget those things. So on a daily basis, he's going, you know what, those things don't matter. I am reaching forward. I'm reaching forward to those things that are ahead. He says, I press toward, I strain for the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He says, I'm straining for it. I'm not back here going, hey, look what I've done. I'm not going, oh, look at me, I'm just walking my walk. He says, I am straining for it. The guy who had all the revelation in scripture, he was never content. He goes, I'm straining, I'm reaching. And can you get the picture of an Olympian, right? You ever watch the Olympics and they're running? And the guy's like reaching as he gets over the line, like they're pushing. There's an intensity on the inside of them. There's a purpose on the inside of them. And that's what Paul says. He's like, strain toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ. Paul was running towards his purpose, right? And we have that purpose. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Man, you got to listen to and understand that we are sons and daughters of God. Our identity is in him. Our purpose is in him, right? And so we have been called to do what? To be holy and blameless before the Lord. So God has a purpose for me. He's called us. And, he, and I have a purpose to respond to the calling of God. God wants his purpose and my purpose to be intertwined like peanut butter and jam, mm -hmm. like hugs and kisses, like a key in a keyhole, right? Those two things, those are the things we need to be reaching for and striving for. God wants us to live to our full potential, to live out the purpose of why he created us. God wants us to live in the potential of the thisness that he created in us. The thisness. How many remember that that message of identity and who God has created thisness inside of me and inside of you? He wants us to live that out. He wants us to have the identity of His sons. We want to be purposeful about the life of God in us, purposeful, because that's what that is. That race, that striving, that running. We're not cruising. We're constantly pushing. And I'm and I've been studying about kingdom for years. And kingdom people are powerful people. It's true. 
Can you say that with me? Kingdom people. Kingdom people. Are powerful people. Powerful people. And you know what? We, I think we need to stop regularly, evaluate the life and the quality of our own lives. I think it's something that every Christian should be doing. How am I living in the kingdom? How am I living in, in God's kingdom? If I measure my life by the word of God, how am I doing? Yeah, if I measure my life, my passions, my love, my intentions, mm -hmm. my intentions, what I, you know, Bible says, whatever you focus on, that becomes your treasure. That's what are true. my intentions? And we need to be able to look at our lives because we're not on this earth forever. We don't have a purpose just to live our lives and to run a race and go to work and have a family and do all this. No, there's a purpose in our living that we're going to look at today, right? If, if God is powerful and his kingdom is, is power, then am I a powerful person? I ask myself that. Am I a powerful person? Are you a powerful person? And we're going to define that a bit. Am I a weak person? I have weaknesses. Sure. Am I living in mediocrity? That's a big one. Oh my goodness, a big one. Yep. Mediocrity is average, ordinary, moderate. Not the best, not the worst, kind of in the middle of the road. It's like you're running that race, but you're not reaching, and you're not striving, and you're not working hard to stay in that purpose and keeping God at the forefront. That's true. First, second Timothy 3, 5, and I don't have that up there, but it says, do we have a form of godliness but denying the power? You know, that's what religion does. We have Christians all over the world going to church and, and on a Sunday morning, maybe, maybe a Bible study on Wednesday night, but through the week, they're not living. They have this form of godliness and they think that they're okay, but they don't have power in their lives, right? Go on Facebook. Just take a look, and you see some of the comments Christians are making, and I'm like, okay, you're embarrassing God, because that's not who God is. We are part of this kingdom. We've got the Spirit of God on the inside of us, and if we set our mission and say, I'm going to run my race with purpose, and I'm going to strive, and I'm going to run my race, man, there's power in that. There's a lot of power. God wants us to be powerful people, because mm -hmm. Christ lives on the inside of us, right? In my life, am I content where I am, or do I want more? That's true. Right? I put in here, Christian people are stressed. They're fearful. They're depressed. Addicted. Mm -hmm. How many people, Christians, are addicted? How many Christians are angry? Unforgiving. Unloving. Compromising. It's like this is not what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to look like. If, any, if you're those things, then you lose your salt, you lose your light, and you lose your influence for the kingdom of God. Sure. Right? And our lives are not our own. We've been bought with a price. We are here to have intimacy with the Father. We're here to promote the kingdom. We're here to be powerful people, to draw people and influence them to God. Mm -hmm. Right? Are our lives doing that? Or in my life, am I content where I am, or do I want more? Yeah. Do I think I can even have more? There's a lot of Christians who are so depressed. It's like... You know, and I've read some of these comments this week, and they're so discouraged, like, well, you know, this happened, and I don't know why God let me down, and, and I'm just angry at God, and I'm like, you don't understand. You don't understand who God is. Get God, you've got God in this little box, and he's very tiny. You've got to expand who God is, and you've got to reach, and you've got to strive to know him, because there's power in his kingdom. You can be a powerful person. James 1.23 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, otherwise you are deceiving yourself. For anyone who hears the word of God does not do it is like a man who looks, his face in his me looks at his face in a mirror and after observing himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. <laughs> I love that scripture. You know, when you go look in a mirror, oh, that's what I look like. Cool. Right? And you walk away and you go, oh, I can't remember what I look like. You guys, can you see your face after you not look in a mirror? I guarantee you can't. And so the word of God is like that too, right? We look in the word of God and we go, oh, look at I'm a son of God. Oh, look at I can be powerful. I've got the spirit of Christ on the inside of me, right? Now, if I don't take that and I'm looking in the word mirror and I'm going away and I'm not, I'm not meditating on that, I'm not pursuing that, I'm not striving for that, and to renew my mind, guess what? I forget what I look like. I forget that I'm a child of God. I forget that I've got the Spirit of God on the inside of me. I forget that he's created me to be powerful, to be loving, to be kind. I forget all of those things. 
And so that's why we need to be in the Word of God, but we need to start doing those things, right? Become aware and then do. Why am I still struggling in some areas of my life? Why have I not yet overcome? Why am I living in mediocre power? Why am I living my life to the full potential of God, who want, of what God wants me to be? God is calling us to a level of intimacy, I think, that is a lot deeper. And you know what? Tribulation and struggles do that, right? The church has always thrived under what? Tribulation. And persecution, right? Because when everything's going good, it's so good to get mediocre and stop our striving and stop our reaching and forgetting those things and not being happy with the status quo, but keep reaching. We need as a church, corporately and individually, to live up to the full potential that God has called. Mm -hmm. To live powerful and successful lives fulfilling our purpose. Yeah. To influence the world and the culture around us. Because we are the light. You are the light. There's a lot of darkness in the world. Yeah. There always has been. But I was thinking about this yesterday. The culture around me was very different when I was your age. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a lot of darkness. And guess what? We get to be the light. We get to be the influencers, right? And what I've discovered is, and one of these things, and I grew up in the church, I was saved since I was six. And, you know, I always thought, oh, God's just going to save me. And he's, I'm just going to be perfect once I become saved, right? And I, it's like, you know, actually, and I thought this. I thought, you know, I'm going to get saved, and, and boom! I'm going to be a perfect Christian. I'm going to be a perfect lover. I'm going to love people, and I'm, and I'm not going to be angry, and I've got all of this stuff. And then I realized, and it was frustrating me for years because it's like, God, why is this not happening? Why am I still struggling with, uh, with unbelief and, and anger and all this stuff, right? And then the years, God has said, you know what? It's I. It's all up to me. God put me in this race. I get to choose. Right? I get to choose. And I'm going to... And I determined that I'm going to run that race. I'm going to, like Paul, I'm going to strain. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to run after. I'm going to find out what God wants. I'm going to find out who I am. And then I'm going to live the way that God wants me to. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to go into a little bit of kingdom teaching because I want you to understand about the kingdom of God. If you understand the concept of a kingdom, you're going to see that God's kingdom started in Genesis to Revelation. God had a purpose and it's amazing. Even the angels go, it's like, God, what, what is man that you're even mindful of? And why did you do this? Why did you put man on this planet? But God had a plan from Genesis to Revelation. And it may look different from Adam to, to Moses to Abraham to David to Jesus. Ultimately, when Jesus opened the door and became that sacrificial lamb. It looks differently, but God's kingdom, the purposes of his kingdom and who he is, his laws, his culture, his his uh, life, everything God wanted to establish here on this earth. Mm -hmm. And here's just a few things about a kingdom. Number one, a kingdom has a king, right? A king, and we don't understand much kings because we're a democracy, but this is something that has been pretty recent, right? In the old days, it was all king. A king has, a kingdom has a king. Deuteronomy 10, 14 says, Behold to you, Lord God, belong heaven and the highest heaven and the earth that is all in it. God still owns this planet. Right? He still owns the earth. Psalm 21 says, The earth is the Lord and all it contains, the world and all who dwell in it. He is still in control. He is going to let things play out according to his will and his purposes. But his plan to establish a colony here on earth is still the same. And that's the next of the kingdom of God is like a colony. Right? It is, isn't that what kings do? You look, at, you look at Britain, for example. Did you know that Britain, country of England, at one time had the most colonies in the whole world. Mm -hmm. There's not been any nation that has ever beat them in the number of colonies that they've had from Africa to Australia to Canada, mm -hmm. right? It's amazing, go, go Google that, you'll find that that's true. And so what they did, they, went, they wanted to colonize. So what they did is they said, okay, we're England, we're gonna go down to Australia and we're gonna take over that country, we're gonna establish a colony we're going to establish our laws, our constitutions, our traditions, our behaviors, our morals, and our culture yeah. in those places. That's true. Right? That's what they did. That's why Canada, for the longest time, we had the queen, right? We emulated, we had a lot to do with uh, England. It's getting less and less and less because we've become more independent. But that was, that's the goal of a colonization. That's what God wanted to do because heaven is, 
He's got his kingdom in heaven, and he says, I want to establish a colony on earth. Yeah, right. I'm going to come, and I'm going to put my man and my people on this earth, and I have a plan. Yeah. I want to bring them my constitution. I want to bring them my laws. I want to bring them my behaviors, my morals, my culture, the whole thing, right? We then we become citizens, right? We are citizens. 1 Peter 2.11, you can put that up, or Philippians 3.20, I think, is first. It says, for our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have, we're part of this world in this kingdom, but we have a heavenly kingdom from where we come from and where we're going, right? First Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, Peter's saying, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from flesh and lust with war against your soul. A sojourner is a person who resides temporarily in a place. A pilgrim is a traveler, a wanderer, especially in a foreign place. We are not to put our roots here. We're, we are passing through. And God's given us a mission, and he's given us a purpose to establish his kingdom on this earth, right? The kingdom of God is what God has been seeking to establish on earth since he created it. And it's always been a mystery that God, our wonderful, awesome God, created in heaven and earth and then placed, placed us here so that we can know him. That we can know the God, the supernatural God who spoke everything into being. He says, I want to be known by you. I want you to know me. I want you to yada. And it's such a deep, intimate word that God wants to know us. Right? And to have a relationship with us. He came to reveal himself in his kingdom. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. I mean, it's cool. God, God put us here. He's the king. So we're, I mean, the scriptures that talk about we're king, we're priests and kings, we're princesses and princes. But God pushed it even further and made us sons. Sons adopted as sons of God. So it, Romans 14, 7, the kingdom of God is joy, love, peace, prosperity, healing, strength, true life. Everything that God is, all that is good, all that is light, because there's absolutely no darkness in God, is manifested in and through his kingdom, right? Bring in his colony down here. God's kingdom has light. God's kingdom has joy. God's kingdom has peace. God's kingdom has power. God's kingdom has freedom. Everything good. It's a kingdom of goodness, a kingdom of true life. Jesus said, I came that I get. you can have life and have it more abundantly. This is the kingdom of God that we are part of. And God's purpose is that that kingdom, by his spirit and by his word, manifested through us, through you and I. That is our purpose. We are the light of the world. We are the salt. We are the love. You know, Jesus said, they'll know you by your love. That's true. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. We're different than the culture around us. We are peace. We are joy. We have all the fruits of the spirit. And we know that on this earth there are two kingdoms. There's a there's a a light kingdom, kingdom of God, and there's a kingdom of darkness. It's true. And human beings, we're locked, as we're locked in this physical body, we live and choose to live our lives in either of these kingdoms. That's true. Every human being on the face of the earth has a right to choose which kingdom you're going to belong to. That's true. You can choose to live under the influence of the power of darkness, or you can live in the kingdom of light. Where everything good is and God, and you can have more of God than you've ever thought possible because of your union with Him, because you're pushing and you're striving. Yes. And the ones that push and the ones that strive enjoy more of the kingdom of God, and they become more powerful in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And they become greater influences and they become greater lights. Everybody has a right to choose. That's true. Yep. Right? Thank God, you know, if you know Jesus, you're made righteous, not by anything that you deserve. You know, it's like Canada. You, Canada brings in, um, what do you call them? Refugees. Refugees. They bring in people that, you know, you take a test, you can become a Canadian citizen. You don't have to do anything to do that. Just write your test. But there's no, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be a certain color and nationality. You know, if you want to apply for Canada, they'll go through the list and they, okay, boom, you're in. Right? Now you get to live here. And what the expectation is that you come and live in Canada, you're going to live by the customs and the, you know, the values and everything else, by the laws of the land, yeah. right? If they come here and you speed, you're going to get a ticket. If you kill somebody, you're going to go to jail, right? 
And so there's, there's, it's the same thing. Paul taught in Ephesians. He says, Ephesians 2, 1 to 8. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Guess what? People who don't know Jesus are still walking according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. They are under the influence of, the, of a spiritual darkness. We know that is Satan's kingdom. Mm -hmm. Right? But he says... Among, the, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, we were by nature, by, by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, and there's another scripture that says that God had to satisfy the intense love in his heart. Mm. Yeah. God, we have so much value to God. He had to satisfy his love. And so he... Because of his great love, oh, go back. Because of his great love with which he loved me and you and you and you and you, right? Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us seat in heavenly places that in the ages to come he might show the exceedingly riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. For by his grace you've been saved through faith that not of yourself it is the gift of God. God's taken us and bought us out of that kingdom, right? Colossians 1.13 says, The Father has delivered us and drawn to us to himself out of the control and dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. He's rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. He's delivered us and he's translated us, plucked us down and said, Now you're part of my kingdom, right? You become part of the colonization you're part of my kingdom with my values, with my purpose, with my life, with my love, with my hope, with my strength. Yeah. Praise God. That's exciting. It's Man, that exciting. is so exciting. 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Man, I tell you, just like you can come into Canada, God says, you don't have to do anything. I'm going to take you just the way that you are. If you're tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired, if you... If you need hope, if you need life, if you need love, if whatever you need, God is for that. And you don't have to earn it. He says it is a free gift. Yes. And then when we become born again, God puts that robe of righteousness on us. And we, we're clothed in that. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful picture, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what? Even though we, we receive that robe by nothing that we've done of our own, but now we're coming to this kingdom, we still have to walk. As righteous people. That's right. Right? Jesus said, I'm coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Right. You know, and God gave me this picture one day. He says, you know, you're wearing your robe, but when you sin, there's this little black spot mm -hmm. on your robe. But Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Sorry. No worries. Sorry to interrupt you. I'll be upstairs in the market office on three months time. Sure. Okay, see you later. Beautiful. Sorry. Thank you. Jesus is coming back for a bride without a spot or wrinkle. That's so beautiful because in the kingdom of God, it's like all you have to do. Oh, God, grace is so beautiful. He says, just come and confess your sin. And you know what God does? It's gone. It's gone. Beautiful picture of redemption, right, in God's kingdom. Why? Because God will fight for us, and he's paid that price for us. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's a beautiful picture. So we have to work, but we have to walk in righteousness. It's like you come into Canada, guess what? You gotta follow the laws of the land, mm -hmm. right? Philippians 2, verse 12 says, Therefore, my dear, dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear of trembling. You know, it's not a light thing. Think back to the virgins. Mm -hmm. They're all virgins, they're all pure. They kept themselves, five of them. Five of them kept their oil, kept full, kept tight with Jesus, full of the Spirit, stayed in that right relationship with God. The other ones were mediocre. That's how I'm going to look at it, right? Not really pursuing God or church or him, and really are not living in the fullness of the power of the relationship with the kingdom of God. That's true. 
<clears throat> we're to work out our salvation. That means we strive and we're running and we're pursuing, right? Yeah. It's something on the inside of us. God, I don't want to miss you. God, if the rapture happens tomorrow, I don't want to miss it. I want to be there. God, I want to be ready for you. The Greek word rendered work out means to continually work to bring something, completion to fruition. We're saved, but you know, we still got to renew our minds. Mm -hmm. We still have that process of sanctification, right? In the middle of our racing, right? We're running our race and oh, something trips us up. Oh, get up, keep running, keep striving, keep moving forward, right? Keep reaching. We do this by actively pursuing obedience in the process of sanctification, mm -hmm. pressing straining towards the goal of becoming imitators of our Heavenly Father. That's right. Romans 6.13 says, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of, righteous, of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself as an instrument of righteousness. So who does that offering? Does God offer you up and say, Yeah, I'm going to offer you up as an instrument of righteousness. No, no you do. I do. We get to make that choice. In the yep. sense, we have full control of our own lives. Mm -hmm. You get to choose. You get to make that decision. We're to live our lives being like our king. Just like I read, imitators of God. Being in a... Put that up again. Oh. Which one was that? Oh, next one. I don't know where you are. It's okay. <laughs> we imitate our king, and we do that by on purpose walking in righteousness. And, and just for a different perspective, walking in righteousness, doing the right thing, is really walking in the culture of heaven. Mm -hmm. We walk in the culture as colonists, as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, that God came to establish and bought us out of the hand of the enemy, plumped us into this kingdom. We walk in that kingdom. And the kingdom of God, did you know, has a culture. Uh-oh. I just lost it. Just like you said, you had troubles when you do this. Jinxed it. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So the kingdom of God has a culture. And you know what a culture is? Really, it's a set shared of attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterizes an institution or an organization. God's kingdom has attitudes, has values. What does God value? We should be valuing that, mm -hmm. right? A particular size society has its own beliefs, its own way of life, a way of thinking, behavior, values, standards, celebration, morality, relationships, how we relate to one another, ethics, even dress, right? We're to be clothed with righteousness. But interesting, that's what a kingdom is. That's what a culture is. And God has his own culture. Mm -hmm. And the culture that... God has looks very different than the culture of the world, right? You were born into one culture. You were born into your family. Guess what? Your culture, your family has its own culture. Mm -hmm. You may have gone to high school, and the high school has its own culture. And so, remember the Petri dish? Did you guys ever have Petri dishes, right? And you put the little thing in there, and you close the lid on it. I can still see it. For some reason, grade three is still impacting me. And then this thing begins to grow. Well, you guys are the same way. I'm the same way. In our family, you're not born, you're, you're born into a culture, but you don't have a culture. Your culture's grown by your family. You go to high school, guess what? There's going to be influences around in that Petri dish of your life, which is going to affect your culture. Can't, Medicine Hat has its own culture. I've lived in Vancouver, but you go to Calgary, you go to anywhere, each city has its own culture, really. And Canada as a whole has a certain culture too, right? Mm -hmm. All those Canadians are always nice, right? Americans, not so much. They're pretty brazen and they'll speak their mind and they're not the greatest. I shouldn't say that. I love you, America. But they're not always the greatest people, right? Not always as, as giving and forthcoming as our apologetic Canadians can be, right? <laughs> but in this natural world, you know, in the kingdom, in the natural world, in the culture around us, people can, people can have a, a level of success even without God. Powerful people in the kingdom of the world, how do, you, how, how do you tell powerful people? What's the number one thing? Money. 
Man, you've got money, you become a powerful person. You have money, people flock to you, you're popular, right? Um, as, but in the kingdom of God, powerful people is defined differently, mm -hmm. right? As born again Christians, we're cast into a whole new culture, God's culture, and it looks very different than the world, the culture of the world around us. We may be living in this natural culture around us, but we got to be very careful that we're not influenced by the culture of the world. Yeah. Because our culture needs to be influenced by the Word of God, mm -hmm. by our King, yeah. through our relationship with Him. And so this is where it gets tricky because you know what? Too many in the church, the church of Jesus Christ that's called to be holy, which means separated, we're called to be righteous, is influenced by the culture of the world. And if you look at, I don't know if you got that thing up for me, Jay. There you go, you did it. The kingdom culture values. God's value, number one, is love because God loves <clears throat> us so incredibly much, right? Jesus said, love your enemies. What is the world? The cultural value is a lot of hate. Like, you know, and especially at Facebook, right? People are just so mean to each other. It's, true. it's like, you know, if you have a different opinion than me, then you are like nothing. And the sad thing is, I've had Christians <laughs> send me emails full of vulgarity because I didn't wear a mask, right? It's like, really? Whose culture are you participating in? Mm -hmm. Where are you? Are you being that light? Are we being like Christ? Are we imitating our Heavenly Father? Scripture says, honor man and honor God. You know, honoring that love is so powerful. You want to be a powerful person, you love. Mm -hmm. That means when somebody disagrees with you, you still love them. You don't have to hate them. You still treat them with respect. There's a way to say, you know what, I kindly disagree with you, but you know what, we can still be civil and we can still be friends. But there's so many, I'm like, like I said on Facebook, people are just hateful. And I'm like, you know what? You're not, you're embarrassing God because that's not who God is. That's not the culture of heaven because we're supposed to walk in love. Jesus said, like I said, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And the thing is, you get to choose. You get to choose in every moment. Are you going to walk in a kingdom culture? Are you going to be an imitator of your heavenly father? Are you straining and striving to be like him? In that moment, when the lady behind the counter is being snarky with you, <laughs> are you going to be snarky back? Or are you going to choose to be, you know who I am? Mm -hmm. I'm a child of God. Yeah, and I'm going to love you. I'm not going to, you know, let you bully me. But I'm going to love you. And yeah. I'm going to treat you with honor. Because that's who I am. Right? right? Friends who hurt you. Are you going to get all... Oh, man, you hurt me. You know, and, and, and unforgiveness is, well, we'll go down to that one too. But we get to choose how we're going to love. I'm reading a book called Keep Your Love On. Powerful book. Mm -hmm. It's good for couples. It's actually a couple's book. But it's so powerful because it teaches you as an individual how to love and keep your love on. Because that's the culture of the kingdom. That's the nature of the Father. We get to choose to be powerful people in the face of other people being ignorant to us. Mm -hmm. it, it, who is more powerful, a person who hates or a person who loves? Mm -hmm. loves. The lover, right? Every single time because the Bible says love overcomes hate. Yes. That's the culture of the kingdom of heaven. Humility, esteeming others is part of the kingdom of God. Esteem others is better than yourself. In the kingdom of the world, pride is all about me. Selfishness, narcissism, people cut me off and they don't care about you because whatever they feel like, this is my world and the universe goes like this around me, that's, a, that's part of the culture and the value of the world right now. But God says, no, I want you to esteem others and be unselfish. But you know what? You can't be unselfish. Because you, you still have a, a nature inside of you because of Adam. But you can choose to esteem somebody who's better than yourself. In every moment, in every situation you come up against, and someone's being, again, ignorant, and they're being selfish, like, okay, that's fine. Right? We, yeah. Instead of bragging about yourself all the time, lift somebody else up. Mm -hmm. This is culture. This is part of the kingdom of God. Yep. Right? This is who God wants us to be. Purity in mind, in thought, in action, 
in the world right now, there is, I mean, there's no purity. There's broken lives. There's, there's abortions. Like, the culture has, has gone so far away, even sexual purity. I mean, years ago, you didn't have sex before marriage. Now it's common. There was no homosexuality on the TV shows. Now it's common. But that's not common in the culture of the kingdom of heaven. Right now, you know, there's even, you know, young people who go, well, it's okay to have sex before. Christians, it's okay to have sex before you're married. It's like, okay, that is not part of the culture of the kingdom of God. That is not. I'm sorry, that is not. Because God has chosen a better way, a more powerful way for the union of a man and a woman that is so incredibly beautiful and honoring to each other. Right? Rather than going and sleeping with a bunch of different people. Right? The purity. Which kingdom? Honesty. Man, what, what, like right now there's lies. People in the world lie. People in the church. I've had business people lie to me and I'm like, and they're Christians and I'm like, hmm, you know Bible lying is, Bible calls Satan the father of lies. So when we lie, guess whose kingdom we're participating in? Guess whose culture we're participating in? Rather than being powerful people and saying, you know what, I will swear to my own hurt and I will never lie. If you lie, it's okay, repent, God forgives you. Get up and, you know, if you got entangled in that, untangle, get up and strive and run towards your purpose, yep. right? Seek God. Right. Giving, right? In the world, it's all me, 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 I hoard, I hoard, I kick my way, I fight my way to the top, I step on heads to get to where I want to go. God is a God of giving, and so giving should become part of the nature of the church. Yeah. Not just giving in church to support the local ministry, but giving to one another. Mm -hmm. Freely, sharing. I mean, the only church, what was the culture there? They had sold everything and had everything in common. Mm -hmm. You know, and I used to be, you know, I, I used to be very, mm, this is my house and I didn't want anybody coming to my house. Then we moved into our big house. And God says, yeah, this is no longer going to be you because this is not my culture, Annie. And so I had, I don't know how many people come walking through my house, strangers living with me. I had a guy uh, coming out of jail. He lived with us for like, what, six months? Yeah. Every Saturday, five children would come. You want to talk about a stretch? For me, who's very closed, right? But God took that because that's his nature. That's his character. And I'm, I'm becoming and imitating my heavenly father. God began to expand my heart. So we give, right? Joy or peace. Let's do peace. Right now, there's a lot of people who are so stressed about COVID. They're so stressed about everything else. But in the kingdom of God, God says, hey, don't worry. I'm with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. If you're stressed, go to the word of God and begin to read. This week, I had some struggles, and I've got some tests going on, and the terror of that was trying to come on me. You know, I literally had to be walking down and just speaking the word. God, I thank you that you've not given me a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. God, I thank you, Lord, that you're watching over me in my life and my times. I will live and not die, and I'll declare the goodness of the Lord. Because you got to strive, and you got to walk, and you got to work to keep that place and that fellowship with God, because in his kingdom, there's peace. And so when we get our eyes and we're involved in the culture and we're listening to the news and we're listening to this and fear begins to come on our hearts, so what? So what if, if they have this thing and, and you can't buy or sell? So what? Jesus is coming soon. We got to take it one day at a time and trust God to lead us because in every crisis, God is always taking care of his church. Yes. Amen. So we can do that. But as part of the kingdom of God, you get to choose and you get to decide. I get to decide. And is it easy? I'm not going to lie to you and say it's easy. But it's like when you're running that race and you're reaching and you're striving and sometimes you're out of breath and you're just working it and you're walking, God, I'm reading my word. God, I'm praying in the spirit. God, I'm worshiping you and I'm struggling with this. And thank God for the grace of the Holy Spirit that comes in and wraps himself around you to give you that strength and that power. Things in this culture, in this kingdom that we have that the world does not have. They can't touch it. Because Satan comes to kill and to steal and to destroy. But in the kingdom of God, we have life. Yes. There's joy in the face of depression. Yeah. 
Man, take joy with joy I will draw from the wells of salvation. God, I'm going to rejoice in you. I'm going to rejoice in you. And sometimes when you're depressed, there's scripture and I don't have time to get out. You begin to sing. You begin to praise. You begin to worship. Yeah. Because there's joy in, the, in God. There's joy in the kingdom. This is part of the privileges of being a part of the kingdom of God. Right. So we get to choose. We can walk. You can be a Christian and walk in the depression if you want to. Mm -hmm. You get to choose. Or you can untangle yourself and start running and striving and run your race and have everything that God has given you. Seek him. Run after him. Mm -hmm. Righteousness. I'm probably running out of time here. Yep. Righteousness. Unrighteousness and wickedness is rampant in the world. Righteousness is just doing the right thing. Doing what the kingdom of God, what God wants us to do. Forgiveness. Again, another one of those ugly things that in the church, and you know what? I, I know Christians who are holding on to grudges. Dear God, do you know how ungodly that is? Jesus says, if you don't forgive your brother, guess what? I'm not forgiving you. Right. People don't want to hear that, but that's part of the kingdom. Right. Freely you've been given, freely received, right? You've got to be able to give that forgiveness. Let it go. Yep. You get to walk in the kingdom of God and let God take care of the rest. You get to love in that situation. You get to love. Yep. You don't have to put them in your back pocket, but you can love and you can honor and let God move you forward. And let God deal with them. And if it's a Christian brother and they're not repenting, they are in a world of hurt when they stand before the Lord. Yep. It's not up to you. The only you get to decide who you're going to be in that situation. You get to decide, am I going to be a kingdom person? Am I going to be an imitator of my Heavenly Father? I get to choose how I'm going to respond. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God has a whole different set of values. And instead of looking at them as rules and laws, we look at them as culture. Understanding that there's power when we walk in the culture of heaven. Sure. When we walk in the culture of heaven, we become powerful people. You become a powerful person when we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, become imitators of our Heavenly Father. When we become passionate about God and keep our passion on. Through the good and through the bad. By His Word, by His Spirit, by fellowship with Him. With him by fellowshipping with His body. People, you know what, I think that there's a separation because now COVID, people are out here and they're floundering because they don't have some place to come to learn and to grow and to hear and to be encouraged and connect with people and say, hey, I'm struggling. Can you pray with me? Can you help me through this? Can you encourage me through this? When we tr um, we've got to put God first in our life when his kingdom needs to be our main focus. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Truly loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. When we cry out to him and are reaching and straining, God, I want to know you. God, I want to know your wisdom. I want that revelation. I want to understand your purpose for my life, God. I'm going to run my race so that at the end of my race, God is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Yes. Look how you walked in my kingdom. Look how you pursued me. Look at the relationship we have. It was beautiful. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture. Hmm. Just trying to decide where I want to go with all of this. It's a <laughs> swallow clock. You know, we do fight against our flesh. Yes, yes we do. Right? Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. There's always going to be that battle. Yeah. But thank God that he's given us his Holy Spirit. I love the fact that Jesus said, Hey, everybody wanted Jesus there. And Jesus, no, 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 no. It's good that I go away. Because yeah, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. That's true. The spirit who is our comforter, our advocate, and our strengthener. He strengthens us in our inner man. He teaches us to pray. He reveals the word and Jesus to us. We need the Holy Spirit. Yes. And that's one thing in my heart. It's like, God, if I, I can't live on this earth on my own, the Spirit is flaming against my flesh, but I, I need more of the Holy Spirit in my life in order to walk the way that God wants me to walk. So I just want to say, I'm going to just wrap it up here. I get to choose who I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. I get to choose which culture I'm going to participate in. Scripture says, I set before you this day life and death. Choose this day who you're going to serve. Yeah. Choose life. Yeah. 
choose life. How do we do that? In order to stay strong in God. And I know you hear this, and you hear this, and you hear this. But I guarantee you, most Christians don't do this. Decide to read your Bible every single day. Mm -hmm. It's so easy for us, present company included, to pick up your phone and go to Facebook. Mm -hmm. How powerful would we be if, you know, even half of the time, instead of reaching for Facebook, we'd reach for a word on our phone yeah. and read a scripture and let the Holy Spirit teach us and strengthen us, right? Read your Bible every single day. Pray every day. Have a prayer life. Because, you know, that's why God brought us into this kingdom. Because we have the opportunity to commune with our Heavenly Father. It's to bring all of our requests before Him. Yep. Decide to worship. And I know wor worship is one of those things. I tell you, when I'm discouraged, when I'm struggling, it's one place that I go. And it's like when I worship God, it's just like He comes and He wraps His arms around me. And He comforts me. There's joy in the presence of God. Scriptures talk about that. And faith, another scripture, and I didn't write it down, but they increased in faith as they worshipped. Talking about in the book of Acts. As they worshipped, they increased in faith. Why? Because they had encounters with the Heavenly Father. Right? Yeah. They had encounters with the Heavenly Father. And you know what? When I was growing up, I actually went four years to Bible school. And I had some horrible things happen by Christian men who did some things and just threw me whole, my whole life for a loop because I never expected Christian men to do that. And I don't know where I'm going with that. It doesn't matter. I lost it. Not meant to be said. But you worship and you push. Oh, that's where it's going. Because growing up, I grew up in the church. I got so angry at God that I said, God, I don't believe in you. Right? And I just shut down. Mm. After a while, I'm like, okay, God, fine. I can't deny your existence. And you know why I couldn't deny the existence of God? It was because I had too many encounters with him. As a youth in the First Assembly, we would have amazing times when the Spirit of God would just touch you. And it was like, you can't even express or explain what happened in those moments. But you know that you had an encounter with a spiritual being that touched your life. Mm -hmm. And so that was the one thing that kind of drew me back. And then God just led me back and I eventually came back to him, you know, and, and walked with God since then, again. Again, learning to forgive, learning to yeah. who do I want to be. You have to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And I know this is sometimes controversial in the church, but God gave the Holy Spirit. When you pray in tongues, you build up your inner man. Right? I love that scripture, Lord, that you strengthen me in my inner man and by the power of your Holy Spirit. When I'm weak, you come and you strengthen me. You fill me up, God. You, it's, it's like his, his power and his spirit overtakes me. It gives me that strength to do the right thing. And then decide to fellowship. Stay hooked up. Stay hooked up to a church. I know right now there's a lot of churches that are, you know, have capacity. They're closed, whatever. But that fellowship of the believers... Yeah. Paul said, forsake not together the assembling of yourself, because there's power in that. Right. This is the culture of heaven, guys. Right? We need to be together yes. to strengthen and have those, those relationships. The culture of heaven is counter culture to the culture around us. That's true. We get to walk in a different culture. Yes. Not affected by that culture, but affecting that culture and affecting the people around us. And that's what's going to make you a powerful person. Because as you saw, that whole list, all of those things, where, where, which side is the power side? Yep. The kingdom of God's side. Yes. That's what God is trying to do on this earth through you and me. Yep. Right? We need to walk in the culture of the kingdom of heaven. I want to be a light. I want to be an influence. And I love what Jeremiah is preaching on having boldness. I'm praying for boldness because when I go shopping... I want to be able to tell people about Jesus. I want to be able to make those comments and those connections. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had those opportunities and I've been scared and I didn't. But I'm praying and I keep praying and asking God for boldness because I'm just going to get up and I'm going to start. The Holy Spirit tells me to say something. I'm going to be that influencer. I'm going to yeah. be that light. I want to be powerful. 
in my love walk. I want to be loving my husband. And I haven't always been powerful in how I've loved my husband. But I get to make those choices. It's a choice of how I'm going to be and who am I going to be. It doesn't matter what he does, who am I going to be. Mm -hmm. I want to fulfill my purpose that God has for me. And I found this quote, and I'm going to end with this. Such a beautiful picture. I'm going to, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to tell you where it came from. Actually, they found it. They found this note written by this gentleman. And this is it. He says, this is what he wrote. I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit's power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his. I won't look back. I won't let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense, and my future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame vision, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, applause, and popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by patience, am uplifted by prayer, and I labor with power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the enemy, pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. <laughs> I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all I know, and the work till it stops me. And when he comes for his own, I love this, he will have no problem recognizing me. <laughs> My banner will be clear. Isn't that powerful? That's so good. Those words were found among a pastor's belonging after he had been taken out, a missionary, taken out and killed for his faith. Mm. They found this note written. Wow. amongst his stuff. But I assure you, this is the author writing this, but I can assure you he did not die in vain. The people he impacted on his corner of the world were changed forever. He did not consider wealth importance or importance or wealth or position of these qualifications for service. He simply had a passion for serving God. Mm -hmm. He knew his privileges, all the blessings of the kingdom of God, and he knew his responsibilities. Um, one of the roads to heaven ran through Zimbabwe, and he was on it. Mm. Isn't that powerful? What a beautiful picture. That's awesome. This is who God is calling us to be, to reach and to strive and to seek and to pursue God until we look and we're in the tears of heaven. Mm -hmm. Let's just pray. Father God, we thank you for the riches of your word. We thank you, God, that you have shown such an interest in us, in creating us, in having us part of your family. I thank you, God, for everything that you've placed in your kingdom, all of your goodness, all of your love, all of your strength, all of your joy, everything that is available to us through Christ in us, through the Holy Spirit, through the Word. God, I pray that you would stir us up, stir us up, Father, so that we can run our race with passion, God, so that I can run my race with passion, God, so that we will be who you want us to be, that we will live at our purpose, mm -hmm. not become entangled in the world, not become entangled with the values or the culture of the, the world, but God, that we would stay the course, be like those virgins that kept that lamp oil full. Mm -hmm. Father, ready when Jesus comes, that we will be ready to meet you and that we'll be known by you, be recognized by you, Father God. I thank you, God, for that. And if anyone in this room is in a place where you recognize that maybe your love has grown a little cold, mm -hmm. then I'm going to encourage you to reach out to God. 
yeah. and seek him. Let, let go of the past. Just let it go. Say, I'm starting new, I'm starting fresh, I'm going to run, I'm going to reach. And I'm going to be all that God has purposed for me to do in this life. Father, we just worship you and we thank you that you'll take this word and that you'll bring it to remembrance through this week. God, it's not something that we're just going to hear today and forget about at 5 o'clock today. Forget about it tomorrow, Father God. But Holy Spirit, your words are life and I pray that your spirit, God, would take these words and remind us and push, push us to pursue you. Mm -hmm. Bring them to our remembrance, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.